Hi, this is Privateer Station, and today we're bringing you day 561 of Russian invasion into Ukraine. As always, with former advisor to the office of the President of Ukraine, Lieutenant Colonel Alexei Rostovich, and in this new format with Nikolai Feldman and Yuri Romanenko. Today they discuss things that are getting in motion on the southern front and how Putin is trying to globalize this war. Of course, special thanks go to our dear members, Klaus Peritis and Bill. Thank you, Bill, for your support. Thank you, Klaus. And with this, let's deep dive into day 561. Enjoy. Hello, everybody. This is Project Alpha. My name is Nikolai Feldman. And we are doing a War Diary live stream with Alexei Rostovich. We are streaming live here at Alpha, at Alexei's channel is streaming live too, and Yuri Romaninko's channel is uh, streaming as well. If you haven't subscribed to any of those yet, please do so, and of course to the English version of Privateer Station. All right, hello Alexei. Good evening. Good evening, Nikolai. Um, we did not have a stream yesterday, so... Thankfully, today Alexei agreed to go on air. <laughs> not, not agreed, I uh, managed to. It's not so easy out here. Okay, managed to, then thank you for trying. Let's start with important news. First one is, uh, I think, let's bring up the situation around Armenia, Azerbaijan and their relations with Russia. We touched upon their statements by Prime Minister Pashinyan to La Repubblica that Moscow has reacted very negatively to and claimed that Pashinyan's statements are an attempt to push the guilt for his own mistakes onto Russian Federation. Azerbaijan is bringing troops closer to the front. Pashinyan outlined that in his statement too. His spouse is uh, out traveling with humanitarian aid to Ukraine, which uh, Russia also noticed and commented. And all of that is happening on the background of some statements and uh, mutual accusations between Armenia and Russia. Alexei, do you think Azerbaijan might uh, still go for attacking Armenia when all these are happening? Uh, it's hard to tell here, Nikolai, because Azerbaijan is, uh, as a typical Middle Eastern country, they have certain Asian country, they have certain cunningness to their plans, so it's hard to tell. We can, uh, however, outline the issue of Russia getting attacks by its neighbors, at least political ones, because uh, their cap capabilities are going down and they're rapidly declining from a notable power to a third-rate country. Uh, for example, Cuba, by the way, popped up in the news and said that they cancelled a couple of recruitment centers that Russia organized in Cuba. and. Minister of Foreign Affairs of Cuba expressed their negativity towards Russia, saying that this is unacceptable. And, uh, you know, these countries were friendly for a while, and this system of uh, mutual relations is crumbling now. Similar situation was in Armenia, where Armenia was uh, heavily dependent on Russian support, and uh, Karabakh clan that is uh, taking power over in Armenia, especially in light of uh, Russian support and the victory in uh, the first war between Armenia and Azerbaijan in the 90s. And Moscow played this card and played Armenia against uh, Azerbaijan and Turkey, but Turkey and Azerbaijan played better, and they ultimately have won this conflict. In, they also have made numerous offers to Armenia to uh, resolve things amicably and build uh, pipelines together. And one of the most treacherous part of that conflict is that when Moscow understood that it's uh, more profitable for Moscow to refuse from supporting Armenia, especially when Pashinyan won there twice and uh, Moscow hates Pashinyan. And uh, he's a slowly leading country to certain changes that Moscow definitely would not appreciate. And they pretty much uh, gave up Armenia. They've been intriguing for a long time with Turks and uh, with Azerbaijanis about the Zangezor Corridor. 
and about Moscow's participation in uh, different pipelines together with uh, the enemies, uh, so-called, at least for now, of Armenia. When all that came to light, Pashinyan was shocked by the position of Moscow, and at first he brought a lot of accusations to Russia. He removed also a bunch of pro-Russian figures from their power agencies, their enforcement agencies in Armenia. He was also considering to leave uh, CSTO organization, Mutual Defense uh, Org, with Russia. And now he is uh, finally uh, coming out uh, very loudly about that. And his wife is visiting Kiev and he is also giving interviews out loud. And uh, the relations between Armenia and Ukraine were rather warm historically, but they were hanging by a thread. And now they're warming up again much rapidly. And the other factor here is that the spouse of uh, Pashinyan also made some statements against Azerbaijan, and Azerbaijan is uh, expressing their upsetness that uh, Ukraine provided a platform for Pashinyan's wife to make these accusations, and I think they'll figure it out between our Ministry of Foreign Affairs and themselves. And uh, in reality, today Armenia is one of the major suppliers of uh, dual-use goods into Russian Federation and uh, one of the main uh, contractor holders for uh, the gray schemes of how to bring those goods to Russia. But it's interesting, right? So when somebody needs to make a statement against Moscow or to demonstrate that they need to change their course and changing their position, they go to Kiev to make that statement. And that goes to a certain leadership position in the Eastern Europe. And I don't think Europe is uh, getting that yet, that the weaker Moscow is, the more attention will be paid to Kiev. And my question is, is Kiev ready to be in this role? Because we need to expand our international politics as well and uh, be a strong regional and hopefully global player. Look, it also is important to make a statement that the United States and Armenia are holding military exercise, joint military exercise together. And this is uh, also going against Moscow, right? In a way, but it also does go against Armenia's and Azerbaijan relations, because Americans and Turks, uh, even though they're members of NATO, they have uh, complex uh, relations. So what do you think? These uh, military exercises, can they have an effect of a fox in a hen house for Russia? Oh, I think they will, because given Russian presence in that area and the base in Gimri, I think these joint exercises will play a strong role. And those statements about possible Ukraine joining, uh, sorry, Armenia joining NATO, they also bring, brought a lot of waves to that uh, relation between Armenia and Russia. Even Armenia had to come out and say we're not going to NATO yet. But I suspect that uh, this is a systemic change, of course, and it's not a random event. Um, another news, United States are placing another military base in Finland, right next to the border with uh, Russia. So Russia, as a result of their 18-month invasion in Ukraine, American bases are now placed directly on the borders with Russia. This is not uh, really a uh, hen in the fox house. This is more like... Uh, bending over situation, right? Russian political space is uh, shrinking and they're now jumping to Africa as to the countries who will accept them as a foreign partner. And there was some news about Russia increasing their relations with uh, North Korea and the trade increasing twice. And the visit of uh, their official leader in uh, late autumn went uh, for this year, and also discussions about possible military supplies from North Korea to uh, Russia. But in order to change the situation, these things need to be en masse. These supplies need to go in uh, 
you know, via rail and huge tra train loads uh, to even affect anything on the front. And we also know that uh, trains coming all the way from Vladivostok, they very often derail on the way, especially the ones carrying strategic cargo and military supplies and stuff like that. What's happening there? Oh, there is a bunch of uh, partisans apparently on the way. And I also wanted to say hi to my son, uh, Sasha. Hi, I love you. I see that you are watching. And Alex, I have a question to you, another one, that Russia is also being amazed by the fact that they are now trading with North Korea. I guess it raises eyebrows, uh, the degree of degradation of their industrial capacity, even internally. One can, you know, start laughing at the fact that Russia is uh, actually asking North Korea for help. But in essence, if they manage to supply reasonable and notable quantities for the front, it will not be that funny on the front for us. So I would say I would be careful here, but I would say, yeah, it's not likely. And uh, at the same time, first let's win the war and then we'll laugh. And then hopefully it means another thing that if North Korea will start supporting Russia, South Korea will also not be standing quietly uh, on the bleachers. And uh, you know where we are? That's kind of funny that uh, Russia and Russia is becoming a proxy means for Koreas to wage uh, conflict against each other. So you're looking at this as a conflict of uh, continuation of uh, Southern and Northern Korea? Yeah, it, it might if uh, North Koreans will try to supply arms to Russia and South Korea will supply more to Ukraine. It will be essentially a proxy war between two Koreas by hands of Russia and Ukraine. So South Korea is already supplying us something, right? Not really. They, it's a complex scheme. They are supporting us on a couple of items, but it's not a direct supply. So it's, yeah, it's delicate. But if North Korea goes openly, then South Korea will probably uh, join uh, the supplies to Ukraine in the open fashion as well. All right, let's go to the front and address it. Uh, let's bring Robotina up. Uh, we have news uh, in relation to General Secretary of NATO, who positively, who gave positive feedback about the success of uh, Ukrainian military near Robotina. Okay, so there are some experts who are commenting this situation in a fashion as such that it would be good if everybody was uh, rich and healthy. And when you're poor and sick, you should not be doing that. And that were reminiscent of a lot of positions of the Western military experts, especially the unnamed ones who are making statements, uh, we would like to, it would be nice if Ukraine should have. I would really want them to, to, to be on the front and to show with their example how to do that, because uh, we are really pulling miracles out there. I will. I also have a dirty joke about that, but I'll um, tell it to you at some other time. Okay. Yep. Okay. So let's bring it this way. So you can see Robotina there with four diamonds next to that. After a short pause that we took for our troops to repel counterattacks, our troops are again in motion. Judging by the statements of our opponents, we are again moving. And what's surprising to me, two detachments of 76th Division that uh, is one of the best prepared. They're usually 28, 30 years, contractors. They just finished serving in uh, paratroopers divisions as uh, Draft, uh, drafted people, uh, and then now they're on the contract, so they're supposedly well-trained, and uh, Russia was hoping that they will be able to change situation on this front. And initially, they were planning to use them on in Lugansk region in order to get uh, the remnants of Lugansk region under Russia. And now they have to withdraw this detachment down to the south. That basically is a good indicator that we are very successful there. And these guys went and tried to counterattack us. And what's interesting is that their counterattacks were futile. They tried to regain Robotina back and they couldn't. And now Russian command is basically 
facing a problem, a dilemma that they need to withdraw 76th to uh, let them rest and to refit them with new personnel, because apparently they have lost a lot. And these people uh, the, that we're calling uh, that are called Russian command, they were given one of the best uh, troops that Russia has, and I was hoping they at least will be able to use them for a week, but uh, they essentially destroyed them in counterattacks in two days, and now they have to withdraw them. And according to the news coming from that front, the fights is happening are happening on the outskirts of Verbovoya on the right at three o'clock. You can see it here, three at four. And then our troops are also you can see a blue protrusion from Robotina to Novokovka, where there are four red diamonds. We're trying to go down south and cut uh, the road over there. And they're also complaining that Ukrainians are going to the west of Novokovka. So where there are two lonely diamonds, there is apparently something happening here. And if Russian correspondents are gauging the situation as risky for Novokopyevka, then I would say I would agree that probably they are suffering there. And they also brought several detachments of territorial uh, defense troops. Um, this, those are absolutely incapable. They're basically remnants of whoever else was not fitting for any other troop. They're being put as the popery into that detachment. So there'll be basically a lubricant for our troops to come further. And our operative success here will turn into their catastrophe on the southern front. And this is likely the most important event happening on the front now with furthest reaching consequences. And all they did, they brought 76th and some remnants of territorials. And that just shows that uh, these parts that they call god awful, as they call in their, uh, we can hear in their intercepts, radio intercepts, this is the best they can aggregate to try to stop us on the southern front. So here, the head of NATO, who actually is keenly aware of the real situation via different intel sources, I really liked how he put back in place those critics who are criticizing the way Ukraine is waging front. He was basically saying that they are incapable of providing real analysis of the situation, and our troops are indeed making miracles there on the front, because in the conditions when there are fewer of our troops and more of theirs. We continue the offensive operation. You can see these black lines, which are fortification lines. Our troops at the pistol shot distance under continuous barrage of artillery and Russian tanks uh, attacks, they're fighting for each orchard and breaking through this defense lines. This is not unsuccessful. This is tremendously successful operation. You just need to realistically gauge what are we doing with what disposition of forces and our critics in the west are not paying attention to another aspect of this operation that one of our goals is a destruction of russian troops on our territory which we couldn't do it back at Kherson region when they withdrew now we're not going to repeat these mistakes we need to destroy the army the logic is simple when there is no russian army we'll take any territory as long as there is Russian army, it will be more difficult to do that. And uh, big thanks to Russian command for helping us to achieve our goals. Those who used 76 uh, paratroopers in counter attacks and wasted them nearly completely. That's the best thing you guys could have done for Ukraine in this situation. And let's go here to Novomayorska and Staromayorska. That's to the right. So, okay, here, right. A little further. Okay, you can see how interesting the front line is near those two diamonds uh, by the blue line near Zavitne Bajanya. Our troops are really close, uh, and uh, some people are saying we're fighting on the outskirts of it. It's not so. We're around it, or ne near it. And if you move the map further to Vugledar to the right, here they have more troubles near Novodonetsk. To the left, uh, thank you for zooming. Yeah, these ones, Novodonetsk and Novomayorsk. That's where they apparently have some issues. Where Ukraine apparently is using a lot of artillery and a lot of different ammo types. 
And apparently Ukraine is winning artillery duels there and uh, destroying a lot of uh, equipment and personnel on the Russian side, which means Ukraine is getting ready to do something here. And this direction is critical for them because in reality this is the shortest route to the shores of Azov Sea. This is basically 60 kilometers, you can see from there to Mariupol. Yep. And there is another one, there is also Vasilivka. You gotta go to the left. Even that part went in motion. They are saying that near Kamenska Ukrainian troops are starting to work again near that uh, water reservoir. Yep, Kamenska Lugavoya, you see the red diamond. Apparently that diamond is under attack now. And as you can see, Ukrainian command is now using several directions in order to tear apart uh, Russian resources and confuse them. And uh, of course, they will be confused and they will try to plug all through the holes with whatever they have left. And I don't think they have much. As a resume, a southern front is now in motion. First of all, Russian command has no reserves, nothing noteworthy there. And those reserves that they dumped there from the east, they are gone. And this is a typical political culture of Russian Federation. They cannot do otherwise, and this is fantastic. We are very appreciative of this special feature of their fighting. And let's go to Marinka. Um, Marinka, that's a heavy fight, a region of heavy fighting. I want to say it uh, almost doesn't exist anymore. And when we were saying there are no changes, meaning that during the heaviest fights, for every stone, every remnant of the house, we are still holding it. And it's to the north. Let's go further. Here is Avdiivka. Also heavy fighting without any successes for the enemy. And they're still hoping to push towards uh, Pirvomaiska. You can see the arrow there at uh, 8, 9 o'clock, that protrusion. But the defense line there is uh, difficult to go to cross and they have no motion. But in order to grind them out, uh, it's a lot of heavy fighting that needs to happen. It's a lot of military work that needs to happen. And now let's go to Bakhmut further here. Okay, so we can see Klishevka, Andreevka, this line of six diamonds from the middle down to six o'clock. And uh, we have moved further. We uh, taken certain positions and they threw a bit more reserves to that area. They regrouped some from the north of Bakhmut to the south. And when uh, they move reserves, of course, when the local troops are failing to hold. That means that we are grinding them down and sooner or later it will give results. If you go further up north, you can see Limansk, Kupinsk direction, Belagorovka and Zlotaryovka. They're trying to move there. You can see the arrows around the front. They're trying to poke us from different sides. And basically, they're trying to take positions, we kick them out if they succeed somewhat. And the prob their problem is that their quality of their troops is falling, is gradually decreasing, so it's uh, more and more difficult for them to do anything effective on the front. Here in Novigorovka you can see the blue perch. They are trying to do some offensive maneuvers here, but the tanks are burning regularly and over 10 tanks were destroyed in the last 2-3 days and probably even more now. So we are still skeptical about naming their losses. Probably they lost even more, but we just confirming what uh, was officially acknowledged. And you can see more actions here to the north of Kupinsk. They are trying still to get uh, Sinkivka, see the middle arrow. It's still on our territory, even on this conservative map, so they haven't. And they already made three statements that they did. So they failed in creating a global offensive on the Eastern Front in order to draw our resources from the South, um, and they totally failed to do that. So I'm waiting for an operative crisis in Russian Federation on the Southern Front. It will not happen tomorrow, might not even happen in two, three weeks, but in some notable time frame it uh, likely will happen. I, my bet is on the end of October, early November, when I think it will happen, and it will be real bad for them. It'll be a big victory for Ukraine. Okay, if we take political agenda about or related to the motion on the front and to the events happening 
in the near front zones. We remember the strike in Konstantinovka that uh, Russia did during the days we were not live. We obviously understood what and how it's a, another strike by Russia on uh, civilian targets. There are a bunch of dead, several dozens wounded, and Russian media and Kremlin propaganda is now peddling the story that is related to a journalist of Bild who supposedly states that this was a Ukrainian missile. So they're trying to put responsibility for the strike on Ukraine. In what relation is that happening to? Do you think they have some problems because they attacked Konstantinovka and now they have to wiggle out of it? I would say it depends. Whom do we take? If we take Lviv and some other guys who are supposedly not uh, working directly from Moscow yet, right? And the guys in the West who are uh, supposedly not working for Moscow. Can we give them the right to make any statement about the front, to trust them with these statements, even if uh, we're not sure about uh, the sources of their concerns? And right, yeah, we do have one people in this conversation, not naming my name, but uh, remember the consequence about my um, mistake about saying what fell from the sky in Dnieper, that's, uh, that was an honest mistake. In this case, can we give them the right to even observe to, to attack Ukraine and bring up these uh, conspiracy theories in the media sphere? I think we, it's, it's a personal dilemma for each of us, but uh, my belief is that we are fighting for the free speech and free speech needs to stay because if we try to save people and try to protect from all these uh, negative opinions and uh, falsehoods that are being thrown in the media sphere, sooner or later we'll start to conform with false tendencies and we'll basically catch ourselves. But one would say that whoever comes with a statement, I think this is a Ukrainian missile, it seems to me, we need to be more precise, we need to bring up questions. Okay, what are your calculations? What is your proof? Stop mixing names of different uh, towns like Lviv did. And these statements like, it seems like, I think that it was, that's where they need to be delicate too, bringing that up. Because for us, it is a delicate topic too, it's a painful topic. We have 16 civilians killed by this missile. And I would think that uh, journalists bringing up such material would have to have some proof behind their statements and not just opinions. Uh, Yura, do you have something to add here? Yeah, this topic causes a lot of uh, speculations and apparently there is a conversation now in the media that this missile flew from the northwest, supposedly, and I was just talking to guys in Odessa, me and Alexei were traveling there, and I, I'm about to bring you some surprise because for the last few weeks Russians are using a tactic when they're using a cruise missile that goes, follows the river Danube near uh, Moldova, then they go behind Odessa and then they change course and hit Odessa from the back. And military are showing the traces that some missiles basically make four circles where they can till they pick the target. And where we can trace it, we do, and we see that, that that's their behavior. That's actually the strategy they're using, the tactics they're using with these missiles. And when they're making these circles, they're also trying to test uh, to see where our air defense systems are in work. And then Often they would use basically a way to cross the border where they can, where they found a breach in our air defense uh, fence. They would go deeper where they can and then turn and hit the target that they initially wanted to. So for those people who didn't know, this is what they have. These are technical capabilities that Russians have and they're actively using them. So when you see the missile coming from the Northwest, there is a significant reason for that. That's exactly what they're doing. 
by the way, yeah, people are asking about us traveling and, and they're saying that uh, why do we have the same curtains in the background? That's because we are in the same hotel, in the same city. We're in a Trimoria summit, which was happening in Bucharest. This is uh, reality. We're actually sitting nearly in the same room, you know, when uh, he's like two yards away from me and uh, on the different near the different window, right? And we even brought these curtains to be uniform, right? <laughs> All right. Jokes aside, we. Uh, I wanted to finish the topic that uh, we started. That these journalists have a right to publish any versions, and it would be good if, of course, they had enough sensitivity to print things uh, with proper caution, and then. It also leaves us a right to treat them as uh, we would after their publications and after they present all the materials that they have or do not have. Um, one quick ask, guys, please do not forget to click like and subscribe and support our work this way. This is an easy thing you can do to help us uh, get more eyeballs. And let's go back to Stoltenberg. He made a statement that Ukraine now is closest to joining NATO than ever in its history. Do you think these words are formality or should we treat it as a significant signal that needs to be acknowledged and we need to try to become NATO member next year? All right. There is a lot of speculations about NATO summit in Washington, given that it will be a heart of the presidential campaign race in the United States and uh, having Ukraine joining NATO would, uh, if it is possible, would be a great uh, card for them to play and uh, so on. But I am very delicate about Ukraine joining NATO at the moment. We talked today with American general, who was uh, the head of uh, US forces in Europe. He said that, and I, and I asked him directly, what obstacles do you see? He said that the obstacle is not of a military character. Military of Ukraine have proven that they are ready to join NATO. They've proven that. And he says the most obstacles are civilian nature. And, for example, civilian control over military, balancing the branches of power. Because NATO is not just military standards, it's also military, political, and probably more political standards. And until we have these standards resolved, these issues resolved, very few people know, but structures of the armies of NATO members are very different between themselves. NATO is giving very wide spectrum of opportunities for countries to have different types and different structures and strategies of how they uh, build their military forces. But political standard is very strict. So the ball, frankly, is not in the military court. It's uh, in the court of civilian politicians. They need to rebalance the branches of power and provide enough political and civilian control. And we still do not have uh, a law adopted about the differentiation about general commander and minister of defense. Do you know how many documents uh, the functions of general commander are described in or mentioned in? Five? No, two. General commander of military forces of Ukraine, who is uh, ordering all the military that are repelling Russian aggression, he is mentioned only twice in the Ukrainian legal documents. Do you think it helps our general commander to achieve his goals, or it doesn't? Because the degree of lack of regulation is uh, really horrible. And General Zaluzhny is in a very difficult position, also resolving a lot of political aspects of this machine. And it works in such a fashion that very often it's not really aiding him in solving the tasks and resolving the things that are standing in front of him. So our legal system needs definitely more attention. He's considered to be an almighty figure that commands all the military personnel, but in reality, his position, whoever takes it, is very unregulated. And this is one of the major drawbacks. And these things, things like that, are not uh, aiding in Ukraine's uh, 
joining NATO. And there are a lot of things like that to regulate. But this is more likely a problem not for military, but for civilian parts of our government. And another problem from NATO countries was signaled to us by President of Lithuania, who made a statement that corruption in Ukraine is the thing that slows down the support of ammo and uh, other nomenclature of military kind from the West. He basically was blunt and uh, addressed the same topic that different journalists had been bringing up these matters since the beginning of war, and now he's bringing that in the face of our first uh, person, of our political leader. How do we treat that? Well, if our viewers are attentively following politics, then they might note a very interesting logic here. Every time before we visit different summits or Americans visit us, Either president of Poland or president of Lithuania would come out and say something about corruption. And I don't think it can be treated or it should be treated as the last warning, because it is important. And very often after these statements, Blinken or somebody else comes to visit us. And, for example, suddenly the case of Kolomoisky is actually being prosecuted to a harder degree than initially estimated. And I think these are signals coming from our immediate allies that nobody is going to joke around uh, in regards to corruption matter. And I think here their expectations are very well aligned with expectations of our Ukrainian society. And president who officially reinforced the fight against corruption is responding to these uh, expectations from our allies. And I guess he's following finally through with what he brought on his banners four years ago when he was winning uh, in the country, when he won his position, he won under the anti-corruption banners. And I guess we can be glad that uh, finally some steps are done in this direction. And I think it's obvious now to everybody that it's time to do that. Right. I, I think it's, uh, you know, very blatant when the country, when the acting president of a NATO country comes out and says, you know, military supplies to Ukraine are dependent on your fight with corruption. Yeah, he made the strongest signal to the political sphere, because very uh, soon uh, some of our politicians of a higher caliber, I think, now understand that after the statement, the next one, the next way to escalate would be to actually point finger at some people and say, these are the ones, because when our society hears that because of so-and-so, and, -so, and I, I'm not bringing names here, but uh, you are not supplied certain nomenclature, I can only imagine the reaction of this society here in Ukraine. So our president has to react to that now. And another piece of news, Israel is going to participate in a summit dedicated to Crimea, Crimean platform. Uh, up until now, Israel has not done that. It was not participating in that. And I want to say that uh, regardless of all the signals that Israel is getting from his, uh, from their political environment, they're still going to get closer with Ukraine. And um, we actually yeah, saw the statement by Netanyahu made recently. I think Blinken's uh, visit is pushing Israel also to connect uh, with Ukraine closer. I talked with Brodsky, their ambassador, and he said that uh, this is not a random decision. That decision was being prepared for a while. It uh, was uh, noticed in the open press also a while ago, and we can just welcome it. And I think this um, is also due to the overflown cup of Israel society in regards to anti-Semitic statement by Putin who keeps attacking uh, our president and his uh, Jewish background just with a constant barrage of uh, idiotic statements. And Israel says that, no, we're not going to just sit tight. And now we have uh, an interesting development, Israeli delegation that is now participating in this summit. And it's a good reason for them to knock him on his nose and uh, for his uh, bad behavior and awful statements about uh, Jews. And last time we also talked about United Nations statement that they did not find uh, that they found it hard to qualify as uh, genocide Russian action actions in Ukraine, and that caused, uh, of course, Dmitry Medvedev in Russia, who came up with a whole tirade 
where he's calling Ukrainians responsible for murder of uh, civilians in Donbass, and they will suffer uh, punishment for what they've done, and special military operation that Russia is conducting on territory of Ukraine needs to proceed until the final goals are reached. And uh, he used the United Nations as uh, an argument to say that there is no genocide, and all the accusations against Russia are false. So United Nations, by their statements, I, I would say, essentially provoke Russia uh, with their statement that uh, to, to go further and to essentially what Medvedev is doing, he is promising more genocide because it was not proved, right? I have said that many times that the West created Putin as a political figure, that Putin works wherever the West uh, fails to work effectively. For a while, he was one of the best friends of the West, put a lot of their economy on the needle of Russian energy sources, and the West is largely responsible for Putin staying in power. And the West is responsible for the politics that Russia is doing now. That's uh, who said today? Stoltenberg. He did say that we did not uh, invade, interfere, we did not interfere in uh, the Georgian war, and we did not interfere in the Crimean conflict. And they understand what responsibility and guilt is. They remember how Clinton came out and uh, acknowledged uh, his mistakes. So now they're starting to be more active and uh, trying to learn lessons from these situations. Because Putin is only putting his foot where the West doesn't. That is also reflected on the propagandist front. Today was an interview by Khlobistin who said that Ukraine needs to be genocided. And he is a trusted person of Putin's speakers, and these are almost official words of Russian power. That Ukraine shouldn't exist, that we should be destroyed, there shouldn't be Ukrainian language, Ukrainian people. So, how does West treat these statements now? We've been, uh, me and Yura, travel to Poland, to one of the biggest forums, and now we are in Romania at the project Intermarium three C's, which is a very key project for Ukraine, and we discuss different uh, topics at the panels here and we listen to other speakers, but people are still very careful in their statements and the way they make them. And this weakens the general West position and strengthens Putin's position. If the position of the West was strict, was stern, then Russia wouldn't have that window, that grey window to operate in, because then they would understand there is nowhere to put their foot. But the West is as it is right now, and we are working with what we have. This is the greatest virtue of a gentleman, I guess. At least we're not shy, we're describing things as they are, at least we do. And Putin will frankly take as much as he would be allowed to. He's playing for the gray zones, for the situations of sub-level, you know, the drone on the, Ukrainian ter on the Romanian territory that fell and exploded that Romania first didn't acknowledge, and eventually they came out and said, yeah, they, it was because of that. It was really a Russian drone. But they're also not telling the full truth, because uh, Russian troops, what they're doing, they're sending drones through Romanian airspace, or joint airspace, uh, border space. And, you know, and that's, and that's then, then they use these drones to attack our uh, port structures, and they're destroying our people. So NATO could either choose to destroy these drones themselves, or at least give us an opportunity, uh, give us a green light to destroy them when they're slightly on the Romanian territory. So that inability to put uh, their foot and say, no, you're not going here, this gives opportunities to Putin's regime to still operate in his favorite gray zone. Okay, you're sorry, uh, you have a thought there? Yeah, there is... Uh, one more thing I wanted to add about Romania. Today, Ukraine came with a suggestion to continue the work of Grain Corridor without Russia, since there are no limits to any ships that uh, go in the territorial waters of Romania, Turkey and the others. And that's where we brought the question that uh, perhaps it'll be a different corridor for logistics for Ukraine, because 67% of uh, export are going through channels on the Romanian territory. That's why Russians are hitting our port infrastructure on the border with Romania, because this is the key window for us to export our grain. And already 25% of our 
goods are being traded through Romania. And you know what was interesting? Our bureaucrats, our uh, government representatives, they're just now discovering the importance of the Trimoria region because there are a lot of interesting initiatives there and how valuable it is. We like, uh, in certain circles, we already are aware of that, but our bureaucrats were basically telling us that's the first time we heard about it and we're amazed at the capabilities. So out of the positive results, it's good that Ukraine now recognizes the potential of this structure and the potential of Romania as the key player. That can be a good alternative to Polish uh, channels because Romania is very close to Poland in territory. It's twice smaller in population, but it's growing rapidly. And unlike Poland, Ukraine and Romania have very few channels, have very few communications. And that's what was discussed at the forum. That's why we should stop wasting money for stupid projects and we should probably reinforce relations and transport capabilities with the countries such as Romania so that we would be more stable. We would not be only using one channel through Poland and the Russians could not break those uh, tiny channels that for now are connecting us with the outer world and uh, further in the West. And yeah, Romania is very undervaluated country today and Ukrainian-Romanian relations have a huge potential and that's what we're feeling on the forum. That's uh, where we are trying with our actions. That's why we are here. And there is one more initiative moment that are not fully recognized by Ukraine because Romania is actively coming out and suggesting that uh, we actually expand some infrastructure capabilities with them, on the border with them. And the answer is on Ukrainian court to give uh, when and how shall we, right? We basically pushed this forum in Ukraine among our bureaucrats, among our government, and I expect that there will be some positive changes because uh, we already see that uh, our administration in Kiev finally starts to see the light because they were not even looking in that direction and now they are. Yeah, and right, it just cost me 25 hits of my forehead on the wall. What? Sorry, Alexei. Yeah, just 25 hits of my forehead on the wall and everything starts to work. Right. I wanted to comment your previous speech about the influence of the West on Putin's growth and their self-position. So it seems like the rule is that indecisive and weak politics of the West aids Putin to in globalization of this war, right? Absolutely. That's a direct consequence. That uh, goes against uh, the conclusions of Lutwak, who is writing that Western interference and in local conflicts globalizes them. That actually cancels that statement and says that Western action helps to localize the war. I also would say, Nikolai, that French politologists can uh, argue with Lutwak that their indecisiveness leads to them being thrown out of their previous areas of influence. And today there was in the news that whatever remaining personnel they had in Niger, they have to, they're agreeing to withdraw. So the West is going through their own crisis, the crisis of understanding. They're going more rapidly through it. It's already good, I think, to see that on the example of Germany, but still not fast enough to match the real needs of this conflict. I'm not even talking about uh, pouring military supplies into Ukraine, which would be good, but just from their own personal goals. Uh, because if you look at their goals, they're formulated as a negative, to not uh, let the conflict expand beyond the borders of Russia and Ukraine. But it's all, it already is. Here is Africa. Here is the relation of Russia and Syria, North Korea, South Korea, right? All that motion, that all is what? This is globalization of this conflict. And the maneuvers by Russia and Belarus on the border with Poland and Lithuania, that conflict is already global, has a global character. And they're still holding on to statements of not letting the conflict cross the borders of Russia and Ukraine. It already did. And uh, the countries have other means to do that, to act, uh, at least in expressing their stern position on certain uh, aspects of this war, not always needed to act in a military way. 
one other note yeah you guys are watching it on one of our channels uh, or if you're watching in english on privateer station do not forget to click the like button and support us and we have the last block here it will be a small one um, before we go there one more important thing so i don't forget now russian federation is holding so-called elections on the occupied territories of ukraine and we already made a statement that this is an international crime on ukrainian laws on international laws and they're trying to legalize them through so-called uh, parliaments uh, of uh, occupied territories and they're essentially prosecuting our people who still live in there uh, in those territories to participate in the elections and i just wanted to remind uh, people who live there that whenever you decide to vote um, i would remind that probably try to maneuver to a maximum to avoid voting in these fake elections do not become part of that crime do not become a participant of that crime if you can be not present if you can just go into hiding try to do that because of course we will understand everything right but it would be best to not participate in the crime to not have to rely on amnesty later but those who actively collaborate i again i'd remind that yeah those who actively collaborate with uh, russia in these uh, pseudo elections that we do have people who are working in these territories and they will be actively fighting against uh, those who collaborate with russian occupants so just a reminder that uh, this is the reality you'll be facing and once again uh, this is unacceptable these elections are unacceptable from all the legal sides and one more thing a legion of russia that we sort of forgotten in our news for a while and they're fighting on the eastern side very effectively near bakhmut they're destroying uh, enemy and their equipment and also they are on the northern borders which shows they have enough troops to be on two different parts of the front and just like ukrainian troops they're fighting together with they're very effective both on the storm actions on the ground and also uh, in navigating uavs and using them against russian equipment so follow them on the telegram where they post a lot of their successes they are not in the hiding a lot of people are asking questions why, why where are they where is uh, russian volunteer corps where's uh, Lib uh, liberty of russia they were known and they were uh, heard before when they were crossing the border they are on the front line and they're fighting well on the front line these are good russians who have who took weapons in their arms and are fighting together against putin's regime and they're fighting for freedom of two countries for freedom of ukraine and freedom of russia super and uh, right before these uh, elections in russia they had a signal out in the media the head of uh, defense committee in uh, parliament who said that there is no necessity to mobilize anyone and everything is uh, done by hands of contract servicemen and i think in this relation we probably should tell about the plans of mobilization for the next uh, six months that uh, russia has their plans are simple their plans are actually straightforward to mobilize 450 more thousand troops all these fairy tales about uh, no further mobilization is only due to looming elections and they don't want to birth a deficit of legitimacy right before the elections i think right after elections uh, they'll suddenly discover that motherland needs troops and i would remind that the first mobilized will immediately be thrown in the front to plug the holes without any preparation it probably will shoot maybe two or three times and then you'll go to the front second or third waves of mobilization will probably be a little more lucky because they'll get some time to train on the training facilities but the first group will be gone immediately just like the previous ones did so dear russian citizens give it a thought do you need that in your future uh, it might be very short-lived and without any preparation you have zero chances on this war Another important news from the depths of Ministry of Defense, General Surovikin disappeared from their website before he was mentioned there together with the General Command. Officially, there was no statement about his resignation and he just disappeared. Yeah, he, I think, got his kidneys damaged uh, according to some reports in uh, FSB prison 
made him return all the money and everything he had and uh, sent him back home. And since he is not a good figure, then they had a technical glitch on the website which caused his disappearance. Things like that happen, you know. Some things happen with Russian commanders. I've, I've been advising Russian generals every evening to meditate on the list of last names. If you cannot pronounce the names of whom you need to destroy for real, you need to meditate on the list of those who were before you, who were killed before you. And let's count them. Lebedz, Rochlin, Kazantsev, Troshev. Who else was there? Romanov. Many, many generals who got high on their political career in the first and second Chechen wars, as they're called in Russia. And what happened to all of them? They all died tragically in different catastrophes. So think. Russian power is afraid of their military for the most uh, part. And they're scared by their military since the 19th century. That's the main fear of Russian czars. And they would never even blink when they need to kill you in another catastrophe. And if you are not sure and inspired by the list of these historic figures, then meditate on Pegorzhin's last name, who was a hero of Russia, got the pistol signed by president, gilded pistol and all, and then what happened to him. So think. So think about it. It's either you get rid of them or they get rid of you. And one more news about Suravikin that showed up today. Russians are trying to occupy Kupinsk and they're building up uh, storm groups and the head of administration there is uh, stating that fact uh, of uh, occupied administration, uh, the Ukrainian side. And he made a statement that despite Russians are forming the storm groups, they likely will fail and will not be able to break through. And in regards to that, I'm remembering uh, Suravikin line, the one that we are now going through, that we're breaking through in the south. I just wanted to make attention, draw attention of our administration that we need to start building some fortification too, and pour concrete in all the fortified regions that we need to protect. Because if we won't have them, we will have to compensate the lack of defense equipment with people, which we have uh, not as many as they do in Russia. So please pay attention to that priority. Just like our administration finally saw Trim Trimoria, Tri-C region, and the structure that uh, brings up to light all the business and other projects there, uh, it might as well be prudent to stop building ice rinks and uh, beautify some of the cities and rebuild the statues, but actually start pouring concrete on the territories where we will need to hold and help our defenders. And also I need to congratulate all the intel people. Military intel day is today. This is their professional holiday. This is the day when this ministry was formed. This group was formed within our military. And this is the day of all intel people including special services and in every troop there are their own intel groups. So all branches of military intel. There are a lot of specialists and it's from special intel operators to radio intel and others, even though radio has their own day. Congratulations to all of you. This is a very non-lucrative specialty. Very few people know the details of your work. This is not the case when you can brag about what you do. You need special character to do that, special strength, because usually in, in the military you need to have a certain feelings towards the military, towards your service, be honest, noble, strong. In case of Intel, they cannot often even acknowledge that they are part of Intel. Very often they can't even have a luxury of walking in the parade or acknowledge to their close ones what were they doing. And very often after the war, answering the question of their relatives, well, they'll need to find some sensible answer, but they cannot give a real answer. But very often these are the people who give a result equal to the results of a whole brigade. Just one person can deliver that. And some of them are uh, even delivering even uh, history-changing results. This is a special character, a special professional strength and character strength. 
These are unique people, so congratulations to all you. All right, colleagues, I think we talked about all the elements on the agenda. We have a lot more, of course, but we will transfer them to our Saturday stream, including whatever else transpires by 9 p.m. in Ukraine on Saturday. And please do not forget to subscribe to Alexei Rostovy channel, to Nikolai Feldman channel, to your Romanenko channel, and of course to the privateer station if you are listening or watching that in English. Have a good night. Bye-bye. Good luck.